Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle, Defining Concepts in Current Media. I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Philosophical Equations of Economics. These books are available online, free for viewing, at www.philosophypublishing.com. They are also available free upon request as an attachment to an email, which is posted at that website. Along with me are our panelists, Mark Brennan, professor of the Stern School of Business, New York University. He is also the American editor of the Quarterly Review of London, England, established 1809. Mark, welcome. Thanks, Chris. Rick Samuelson, graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton and an MA from Tufts. He is also retired head of securities from UBS Japan. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts being used in current media and compare the essence of the concept with the usage and circumstances in which the term is being used. The format of the philosophical angle is that your host will bring forth an opening statement on the nature of the concept for your consideration, and our distinguished panel will react with criticisms, questions, and their own definitions. And now, this week, <clears throat> the subject uh, of usage is the 1%. Recently, something new has popped up. The term is the 1% as generated by the media, President Obama, and the Democratic Party. We here at the Philosophical Angle feel it is incumbent upon us to define and explore the meaning of the 1%. It appears that the 1% means the top 1% wage earners in the United States. As reported in the media, this 1% pays approximately 70% of the revenue coming into the U.S. Treasury via the IRS. Well, the philosophical angle would like to understand what is the makeup of this 1%? How is it that this 1% of wage earners got to be where they are today? And why did the 1% become the 1%? And why are the rest of us the 99%? Well, if somebody's in the top 1%, it means that they have created a lot of income for themselves and putting themselves into the highest IRS tax bracket of the progressive U.S. tax system. And what is it? And what it means is that this 1% is the group of the highest active producers of wealth in the nation. It means that a person within the highest 1% is producing more and thus receiving more in compensation from the company or producti productive entity in which the one percenter works. The one percenter is responsible for producing the goods and services which are valuable to the buyers of the company's products. People desire that production, therefore they come to buy the company's products and services. They buy the product in order to better their lives and to raise their standard of living. A one percenter, such as a company president, has agreed with the company to produce things and it is his responsibility to perform these obligations and of course the higher up you go in a company, the wider range of responsibilities you incur in order to generate the product and or services of the company. Now, what is it that enables us to produce any good or service? The content of all production is that we make a sacrifice of our risk, our time, our effort, and our knowledge and information that goes into making any product or service to receive a reward. And the sacrifice and the, re and the reward both have a value. A president or any executive or anybody with responsibility to produce a good or service 
always tries to reduce the risk in making the item or service, reduce the time involved to make the item or service, and to reduce the effort to make the item or service naturally. He does this by increasing the knowledge of the company that is operative on the risk, the time, and the effort by reducing the quantities of these variables, enabling the company to produce its products more efficiently. We have established that this 1% is responsible for the company's obligations to produce a good or service that people desire and thus buy. These buyers recognize that the company's goods and or services will bring them up away from misery and enhance their living, which is good. Now you ask, what if we take away from the net compensation that the 1% receive, which is their reward? And you ask, this because the U.S. political scene is presently debating whether we may raise the taxes of the 1% through the confiscatory device of the government called the IRS. Well, if we take away too much from the 1%, their compensation, that is their reward, will become of less value than the corresponding and commensurate value of their responsibilities and obligations that the company places on the executives, the company president, or other of the 1%. Should this value of the compensation, that is their reward, fall too far, we can expect there will eventually occur a problem in the fulfillment of the corresponding responsibilities by the 1% for the benefit of the company which is to benefit of the buyers of the goods and services of the company, which raise the buyer's standard of living. That is your, or our audience's, standard of living. Hence the startling conclusion here is that should we impose an impedance on the fulfillment of the responsibilities and obligations of the 1%, which exceeds their fair value, that is, of current media, fair share, then our consumers and the economy as a whole will be harmed. Thus, we should be careful to not overtax the 1% as they facilitate the advancement of the U.S. economy and our standard of living. Let's now move to our chart. And we can see we've made a chart of executive employee and the company, we can see that the value, that is the sacrifice of the employee, in return he receives a reward which has value, and the company will also have a sacrifice and a reward for it. Okay, now let us go to our panel. I'd like to start with you first, Rick to see what your general comments are. Well, I, I, I'm struck by the assumption that in this argument that uh, you know somehow our tax system is not progressive already. <clears throat> As I understand it, something like 50% of American families pay no federal income tax as things stand. And within that... Oh. 50%, there are a rather large number uh, who get food stamps and other benefits. So I think the starting point for any discussion has to be that the United States already abides by a pretty progressive income tax regime by any standard. Uh, so the question here is, do we make it more, quote unquote, progressive or not? Uh, the actual number of families that we're talking about that earn over a million dollars is something on the order of 300,000. So uh, it's a rather narrow group that are meant to be uh, undertaking presumably a larger burden. Uh, and, and I 
think that presents a, a pretty obvious ethical dilemma. Uh, I think one of the one of the several things driving the argument on the left, or from the left's perspective, is the observation that uh, middle class incomes are stagnating that the ranks of the officially designated poor, and you can, you can certainly argue with this evolving de definition of who's actually poor or not, seem to be growing, um, and therefore something, quote unquote, needs to be done. Uh, and that if you hearken back to the 60s when income tax rates were higher and the whole system was more progressive, we never <coughs> had ro robust uh, growth in GDP, and therefore why not go back to those days when uh, progressive rates topped out at, you know, well over 10%. Uh, I mean, the problem is that ignores the international context of the United States now competing amongst many countries uh, with a workforce in which productivity growth is, is relatively stagnant over the last 10 years. It's grown a bit, but not nearly enough to afford the middle class an increasing standard of living uh, in line with, you know, actually growing costs, because I don't think, as I've said before, inflation is measured correctly in this country. So the real issue, to my mind, is how do you grow uh, productivity in this country, not how you redistribute what is in fact a, a, a smaller pie than we had not too long ago, only a few years ago, uh, because the rich suffered just like anyone else in terms of their actual wealth as measured by stock options and stocks and so on and so forth. Uh, so the real issue to me is how do you grow productivity, not how you redistribute a smaller pie. Okay, good point. Um, Mark? Well, Chris, I'm just wondering why we would even expect the average American to not think that equality is a good thing. When he turns on the Republican debate, he hears moronic things from leftists like Mitt Romney saying that he will not touch Social Security, which, if nothing else, is just an equalizing. Actually, it's not an equalizer. It's uh, a gang of elderly people who have decided to take it from their grandchildren. So the, the word equality probably sounds better than that, but you've got a moron, like a left winger, like Mitt Romney, who's up there saying he will not touch Social Security and old people do not have to worry about that. So when we talk about a progressive tax rate that will equalize things, then your average, you know, Fox News junkie who thinks he's getting some sort of conservatism pounded into his head when he's really getting nothing but slightly less extreme leftism pounded in his head. Equality probably sounds like a pretty good thing compared to what's out there with these morons of the Republican Party who are proposing things like the mortgage interest deduction uh, and other idiotic elements to the tax code that do nothing but distort economic productivity. Um, you mentioned uh, Social Security. Um, did you... It, we, it's we, a tax. It's a tax we all pay. Okay, it's a, direct, it's a direct redistribution of wealth from uh, poor young workers to often wealthy retirees. Am I to assume that you would like to actually rid our uh, uh, rid the the uh, U.S. tax system of an IRS uh, Social Security tax? Uh, well, my ideal thing, Chris, would be to get rid of the withholding mechanism. If you ask your average American how much he makes on a biweekly basis on his paycheck, he can tell you oftentimes to the penny what his paycheck is, but that's the net amount. If you ask him what the gross amount is, he can't come within $100 of telling you what the gross amount is. And it's like when you uh, do a withdrawal for your IRA for, or, or to your Kia or whatever, your 401k, from your paycheck of $200 a month. If you never see that money, you don't care about it. What Milton Friedman did, another paragon of the left, uh, to fund World War II, he convinced Roosevelt to put in the withholding mechanism because it used to be that you'd square up your taxes once a year with the government. And in order to fund uh, our, our escapade into World War II, Milton Friedman got Roosevelt to agree that anybody who owed more than $75 in taxes in 1942 could forego 
that tax payment if they would just sign up for the withholding mechanism. That withholding mechanism has empowered the left, both its far, its far left uh, uh, branch, the Democratic Party, and its slightly less left Republican branch to do nothing but steal from Americans. Imagine this, Chris. Imagine if you took every American and said, here's the deal. You're going to get your gross paycheck. April 15th, you're going to cut a check to the government. When people started seeing how much money they were sending to the government, I don't care which class you're in, the 1% or the 99%, there would be a civil war the next day when your average guy who's making 100 grand had to cut a check for, I don't know what, 30 grand? He doesn't have that money. He spent it. When he actually sees what he's spending it on or sees the amount of check that he's cutting as opposed to just having it bled slowly over the course of a year, there'd be a civil war the next, the next day. We, we, forget about the IRS. They'd be going straight to Congress. <laughs> Very interesting on the um, on the withholding tax. Um, I don't even want the I don't even, I don't want the tax code changed. Just change the method of payment. And why would that help? Why would uh, just the method of pay uh, of payment help? Be, because right now no one knows what's being taken out of their paycheck. Because no one looks at the gross amount of their paycheck. People only focus on the net amount of their paycheck. If you had any, if you if you were given biweekly the gross amount of your paycheck and told by the government. Be sure you save up because you're going you're gonna to have to cut a check for 50 grand in April. You'd have about 300 million pissed off Americans. That's probably true. Very good. So, so therefore, therefore, this change, when you've got weirdos like Mitt Romney up there who are so far left, you would think they'd be, you know, vying with Ralph Nader for whatever crackpot third party he's running for. But instead, he's decided to call himself a Republican. If this were to change, people from like Rip, Mitt Romney and, and his, his cabal of morons, uh, would be swinging from lampposts. Uh, Rick, do you think this is a, a feasible idea to be able to get rid of, in this election cycle, the, uh, uh, the withholding tax and, and just make it a, a, uh, something that you pay at, on April 15th each year? I, I agree that's preferable, actually, so people know what they're paying. Uh, I think a more important imperative, actually, is uh, reforming the, the tax code so that uh, it's not nearly as complicated as it is currently and we get closer to a flat tax kind of approach uh, with fewer deductions and exclusions and so on and so forth. Um, so I think, I, and I think that's something that, that's also eminently practi practical from a, a political point of view too. I mean, that's something that even the Democrats might be able to buy into. Okay. Chris, Chris, as long as we do that, as long as we're going to do that, I would like a law to be passed. You know, as long as we're going to make me dictator for the for the uh, length of the show, a law to be passed that no member of Congress is allowed to hire outside help to do his tax return, and if he makes any penalty, whether he underpays or overpays, he would owe a hundred times that amount in penalties to the government. <laughs> would you know, that we, be? We waste we waste countless billions of dollars in this country complying with the tax code because they've made it so complicated. I have three master's degrees. I'm a certified public accountant. I spent 20 years on Wall Street, and now the PhD thing. I can't do my own taxes. What kind of a moronic system has been devised that someone with my level of education, and I'm not trying to toot my horn, I'm just saying somebody who knows how to read a book from front to back can't do his own taxes. That is idiotic, and it's designed, and it's purposely built that way because I have no idea what my marginal tax rate is. So when I hear, you know, well, the tax rate will be this. I don't even know if that's a cut or a raise for me. And it's so complicated. I've got state, I've got local, I've got federal. Like Rick said, just let's just get rid of all the idiocy. And the one way we could do that would be by making senators and congressmen do their own taxes without being allowed to hire somebody to do it and severe penalties if they make a single mistake. Well, that's uh, certainly uh, uh, being proposed um, um, in the debate that, about that a flat not, tax. That is not, that, uh, th 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 my idea of penalizing senators and congressmen is not being proposed. I remember a couple of years ago when the, the guy from GM showed up in Congress with you know a seven foot tall tax return next to him, showing him what compliance costs them. It's 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 criminal. Well, I, 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 I so think... somebody somebody's got to fund all the Republican Party's boondoggles. So I guess that's us. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I I have to agree with you. I think uh, there aren't many that would disagree. Uh, but you know when. When, when, you, when you've got two parties in this country, uh, the party of greed versus the party of envy, they're both looking to take, and they can only take from people who have. So therefore, 
it comes out of my pocket. Well, along the same lines of what you just spoke uh, regarding uh, uh, the tax code and uh, making uh, uh, the legislature uh, body uh, uh, fulfill uh, uh, an obligation to use uh, to to do their tax returns without an advisor. Uh, Sarah Palin uh, earlier this week, or was it last Friday, uh, had a uh, op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal that uh, uh, excoriated the uh, legislature for exempting themselves from their own laws. And uh, as this is, uh, seems to be really uh, relevant to our present conversation, I, I bring it up. Um, uh, it was a, an amazing piece which uh, showed some of the things which Congress exempted themselves uh, in, uh, in, in, in their own duties. Uh, uh, and yeah, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm sure that that buffoon did all the research on her own and wrote it up. Yeah, this, this is the woman who, when they took her aside to explain foreign policy to her when McCain first picked her, she didn't know what World War I was. Well, uh, be that as may, well, that'll have to be a subject for a separate conversation. Uh, getting back to... Uh, you brought it up. Uh, getting back to our uh, our, uh, uh, our conversation here on the one percent, um, let's go back to a statement that, uh, uh, that I think Rick made earlier in the show uh, regarding the uh, in spite of the uh, higher taxation of the fifties and sixties, uh, there was a considerable prosperity involved at the time, and yet uh, with a lower uh, taxation here. Uh, the uh, 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 we are not as uh, productive. In other sense, the 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 growth in the United States is not happening as it did in the 50s and 60s. Uh, can uh, can you guys uh, uh, kind of go over that and see if we can uh, uh, and explain how is that how is that is possible? Uh, Rick, let's start with you. Well, I, I think it's clear that you know the internationalization of of the trading system and the fact that other countries have caught up to the United States. You know, remember, into the 50s, the United States accounted for over 50 percent of uh, world GDP, well into the 60s, in fact. And today, it's maybe a quarter of world GDP at that. So it's relative domination within the, the you know the trading system was has, has declined, and frankly. Uh, that's one of the great achievements of the United States in uh, fostering that development. So uh, this is something to be applauded. But a consequence of that is the fact that uh, relatively expensive American workers are now competing with uh, cheaper workers in other locations. And so there's naturally been a migration of manufacturing concentration, particularly in the auto industry and, and steel and others. Uh, initially, but in, 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 a, in a growing number of other industries over time, to uh, locations where labor is less expensive. Uh, so this is a, a natural process by which, you know, the United States average United States worker has to prepare him or herself to specialize in areas of value added that where, where the United States can remain competitive despite having you know, higher uh, factors, factor cost of production. Uh, typically, these will be in services and technology and, and so on and so forth. Um, but you cannot, you cannot reverse the trend. I mean, that's simply never going to happen. So I do adapt and, and prosper on that basis and grow your productivity levels on that basis or your living standards will languish. Okay. Mark, uh, why do you suppose that the, uh, the productivity uh, yourself has also a, uh, what, do you, uh, what, what would you opine as the uh, decrease in uh, productivity uh, uh, of recent? Uh, of late? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I would echo what Rick said. You know, uh, okay. I don't think the tax code is the single determinant of economic prosperity. So to say that you know, we had a higher tax code in the 60s versus today. Therefore, a lower tax, a higher tax code, you know, counterintuitively creates greater economic prosperity. That's, that's, you're leaving out so many factors out of the equation that it's almost like, you know, third grade regression analysis. 
Okay. But what is driving down productivity today? You know, the only good book, the only, the absolutely only good book that Paul Krugman wrote was actually about productivity. And if you read it, if you read it, it's, he wrote it about 15 years ago. If you didn't know who was writing it, you wouldn't believe that it was him. Uh, productivity is the key. It's about the only thing that matters right now. And uh, it's a whole show. I, I, I can't even begin to scratch the surface of what the problem is, but uh, American productivity is, is, is key right now, and it's just not working. Okay. You know, uh, earlier uh, we talked about um, uh, the 1%, and if they increase the taxes on the rich, um, it really assumes uh, the, the Democratic Party and, uh, the, and those purporting a, a larger uh, slice of the productivity pie in form of taxation, uh, it really assumes that the government can, can help increase productivity. I personally very much disagree with that assumption, uh, but I'd like to hear uh, 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 just uh, a couple minutes from you guys. <clears throat> uh, Mark, uh, do, you have, uh, do you think that the government can be productive at all? Uh, absolutely not. The government only imposes deadweight costs on the economy. <laughs> right. And Rick, how about yourself? Well, I think as soon as the government veers from the basic requirements of maintaining defense, uh, a, a public education system, uh, police services, firefighting, uh, and other basic services of that nature, uh, it detracts from the overall productivity potential of a country's GDP. Uh, because the government can't possibly make anything or deliver any service that is of significant value in the private sector. I, in earlier comments, I've suggested that maybe the space program has had some uh, technological spinoffs that have been valuable, and maybe certain government grants to universities have had some basic research benefits that have, have been useful for private industry. But uh, above and beyond those very narrow contributions, by definition, the government cannot do this. Okay. All right. Well, we're out of time. Uh, go ahead, Mark. Chris, one, one, Just... one last thing. Rick, Rick left out one very important function of the government, which I'm sure he'll apologize for forgetting. Uh, that would be a municipal garbage pickup, which we have in New York in spades. Talk about <laughs> unproductive. These guys. Good, Mark. Well, uh, we're going to have to take this up next time. We're out, flat out of time. And uh, okay. so I want to I want to thank you guys for uh, being a part of this. And we'll see you all next week. This is the Philosophical Angle, and I'm Chris Angle. Thank you. Thank you.